Well, good morning, church. I just want to say how thankful I am to be able to speak today and to share um, in this series that we're in called The Grace Effect, all about the book of Galatians. And Pastor Jason, if you've been here, has just done just a phenomenal job of working us through book by, or chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And um, I hope you'll take your Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 3. We'll be there in just a moment. But I want to start by um, just sharing a little story. It's kind of unique about this story because... Um, on Thursday, it will have been a year. So on September 19th, a year ago, I had a pretty major surgery that I had to fly to Buffalo, New York to, be, to do. Um, and I had to recover for a couple weeks afterwards before I could fly back. So we were able to get this hotel um, in Buffalo, right outside Buffalo, where you could literally see Niagara Falls from where my hotel room was. Um, and as I started to get to feel better in the mornings, I could walk, get some coffee and walk down to the falls and stuff. And um, what just a phenomenal way to heal. And if you've never been to Niagara Falls, it's gorgeous. I definitely recommend you go. But I heard a story about Niagara Falls. It was in 1859, a tightrope walker named Charles Blondin uh, went to Niagara Falls. He stretched a three-inch wire over the gorge and walked 1,100 feet from one side to the next. Um, and he didn't just do it like a normal person would do it, right? Um, he did it blindfolded in a sack, pushing a wheelbarrow on stilts. And he stopped halfway across and cooked an omelet while sitting on the wire. Um, at one point, he stood on a chair, balanced on one leg on that same wire. That's not all. There's one more thing. He carried a man on his back across that tightrope. Now, that's either the most extreme example of trust or just plain stupidity that that person has letting him carry. Um, it actually was his manager who let him carry him across that type rope. Now, imagine if halfway across, the manager says, hey, thanks for getting me this far, but I've got it from here. Like, imagine if he said, like, look, you've got me this far, but we're about halfway. I think I've learned what you've done. I've seen how you handled it. I think I've got it from, for now. Can you even imagine, like, how terrible that would be? It would be the end of him right there. After being carried that far, why in the world would he think that he could make it the rest of the way on his own? Now, my fear is that many of us are doing the same thing in our relationship with God. We've trusted him so far. We've trusted him to save us from hell. Whenever you got saved and gave your life to Jesus, you believed that he would save you and take you to heaven. You'd spend eternity with him. You believe that. But my fear is that we have trusted him so far. We trusted him to save us from hell. But now we take back control. Like he's been carrying us, but now it's like, no, God, I got this. I think I've got this figured out. I can handle this from here on out. How audacious is that of us? So my goal with this passage in Galatians chapter 3 is to break it down pretty simply for us, and here's why. I get a little fired up anytime we start adding things to the gospel. Um, I don't know about you, but I was raised with this idea that grace saves me. Yes, there's enough grace. Get saved, it saves me. Yes, Jesus dying on the cross, it gets me out of hell and into heaven, but that's just a start. Now I better do all these things and check all these boxes and wear just the right clothes and listen to just the right music. Otherwise, I would disappoint God every single time. And let me tell you, I felt like I was doing a lot of disappointing. Were you raised in a grace-based home or a rules-based home? Think about it for a minute. Or what is your home right now? Is it a rules-based home or is it a grace-based home? Uh, the way I was raised, mine was a rules-based home, lots of them. And they kept adding to them the more legalistic we got. Um, just to give you a little context, but before I do that, I need to say this. Um, I love my family. My dad was a pastor. Um, we were Baptist, yes. We were independent, fundamental Baptist, King James only Baptist, separated Baptist. And as a young kid, two days a week, we would go door knocking. I'd be wearing a suit and tie. We'd go door knocking a couple hours at a time and get door after door slammed in our faces. We're telling people about Jesus. And if I didn't want to keep going or if I felt like it wasn't working or if I raised a question, I was then looked at as though something was wrong with me. And one of the greatest yet hurtful memories I have of this, um, and it's a weird memory, but it stands out like it was yesterday. I was 10 years old. It's a very specific situation. 
Um, I was 10 years old, and we lived in Texas at the time, but my grandparents lived in Michigan, and my family lived in Michigan and stuff. And so at 10 years old, my parents allowed me to fly to Michigan to spend Christmas with my grandparents and my cousin. I was so excited with my cousins. I was so excited about it, had a great time. But my grandma, while I was there, wanted to take her grandkids to a movie. So we went and saw Toy Story, the original Toy Story. That's how old I am, the original Toy Story. And when I got back from the movie, I was told I needed to call my parents because they had called to left me a message. And I called them and talked to my dad only to be told that I was grounded and how disappointed he was in me that I went and saw a movie because fundamental Baptists don't go to movies. And I need to be clear, man, I am thankful to have had parents who feared the Lord, uh, parents who at least took God seriously, made sure I was in church, made me read the Bible. My parents loved me. I know they did. But as I grew older, I started to realize that there was a lot of fighting at our house, specifically with my older brother and my dad. My brother is three years older than me, and he just flat out refused to play the game of being a Christian. Like, he wasn't going to even pretend. Um, so my dad and him would fight a lot. Um, I remember standing there as a 14-year-old boy watching my dad and my brother get into a fist fight because he wasn't following the rules. Now, I wasn't mature enough or old enough to understand this yet, but here's what I wish would have happened. Instead of fighting to be right, I wish they both would have fought to win the relationship. Because if you're going to fight for something, fight to win the relationship. Fight for grace. Fight for love. Fight for relationships. You see, I did see a lot of fighting growing up. Fighting to hold the line. Fighting to not compromise. Fighting to separate from anybody who doesn't read the King James Version of the Bible. I was raised to fight. And a lot of you might have been raised that way too if you were raised in a rules-based home. But I do want my kids to see me fighting. I do. I want them to see me fighting for them, fighting for grace, fighting for second and third and fourth chances. And I want them to know that they are my kids no matter what. And just when they think that there's not going to be enough grace, somehow there's going to be enough grace because God never runs out of grace. So naturally, as a teenager, I didn't want to get beat up or into a fist fight with my dad. So you know what I did? I started pretending. Man, I could play the part. I could look good. I went into image management mode. But maybe, maybe a therapist could help me with this or something. Maybe it was like a protective posture so that I didn't get into trouble all the time. And if there's one thing chapter 3 of Galatians reminds us of, it's this. Beware of the performance trap. You see, our walk with God from beginning to end depends on our faith in Jesus Christ, not our performance. And if you've been hurt by the church and you've been told you haven't performed well enough, you haven't looked the part, you didn't act right, I'm sorry. If you've been hurt by this church or any church, I want you to know there's grace for you. Grace has not ran out. There's plenty of it. And my prayer is today that you will find extra grace, that you will have a realization of just how much grace is available to you, even you, that there's grace for you. Um, if you've been thinking that your performance isn't good enough to live up to heaven, then you are right, and you can stop performing. You can stop pretending. You see, Paul is writing to a group of Christians in Galatia who started to blur the lines between performance and grace. So he starts chapter 3 very aggressively, like Paul wasn't going to put up with this. So he has to be very aggressive in what he says to them. So Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse number 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He says, oh, foolish Galatians. He's basically saying, okay, you're acting like idiots. That's literally what he's telling them. You're acting very idiotic. That's what he's telling them. You're being foolish. You're acting like idiots. He says, who has bewitched you? Like, who's put this trance on you that's changed it? Like, that's made you change what you believe about the gospel? He says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, in other words, he's saying literally in that term, he's using words that have to do with billboards and posters. He's saying literally before your eyes, I displayed the death of Jesus Christ. I displayed that Jesus was portrayed on that cross and that is grace and that's how we live the Christian life. Jesus was portrayed as crucified for them. Paul's telling them, I showed you. And then in verse two, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit 
by works of the law or by hearing with faith. You see, when you get saved, we believe that you receive the Spirit. You get the Spirit when you get saved. And Paul's saying here, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by flesh? Are you so foolish that you started with Jesus on his back, but then as you started your Christian life, you've kind of jumped off his back and now you say, I've got it. That's what Paul's telling them. Are you that foolish? Verse 4, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? He's saying to them, church, in Galatians, is it God, is it Jesus, is it grace, or is it works? Which is it? It can't be both. So he says, oh foolish Galatians. Man, these strong words were well-deserved. You could also say, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. And calling the Galatians foolish, Paul did not mean that they were mentally deficient or morally deficient. He didn't mean that. You see, Paul used an ancient word here, antios, which is the idea of someone, and y'all are going to know somebody like this. Somebody's going to come to your head. It's this idea of somebody who can think, has the ability to think, has all the knowledge, they just don't do it. A lot like teenagers probably, right? Like they, you think they've got what they need, you've told them, but they're just not doing it. It's kind of like the 2024 Texas Rangers. Last year, they won the World Series, if you haven't heard. I'm a huge baseball fan. They won the World Series last year, and this year, they're likely not even going to make the playoffs. They have the same roster, better roster, actually. They have better pitching for sure. They have everything they need. they need. They're just not doing it. They have the knowledge, they have the ability, they're just not doing it. And that's what Paul says to these Galatians. He's saying, you know better, you have what you need, you have the ability, but you're not doing it. So why does he call them foolish? Here's why. Because they are buying into the belief that more is needed to follow Jesus. That more is needed to follow Jesus. And what Paul is saying is this, Continue in the Christian life the same way you started, by grace. The same way, not performance. Anything else would be ridiculous. So we don't start with grace and then have to earn grace. We start with grace. We keep grace. Grace is with us all along the way. And we don't even arrive at grace. Grace is already there. You see, I was taught that if you work hard enough and do the right thing, you'll arrive at grace. But what changed my life was when I realized that grace is there with me the entire time way. You see, there are three things that I want us to understand as we work through this passage, just three things. One of them we've really already talked about. Number one, the entire Christian life is based on faith, not performance. Church, the entire Christian life is based on faith, not performance. Beginning to end, you don't arrive at grace. You start with grace. You have grace all the way through. The entire Christian life is like this. But the second thing Paul reminds them of is this. This is the way it's always been. There's this idea that something completely changed in the New Testament, and Jesus did change everything, yes. But look at verse 6. He says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's us. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And here's the thing. This really gets to the core of what I believe is one of the biggest mistakes we have when we read the Bible. It's why so many of us have the wrong idea of how to grow as Christians, If you ask most people what the Bible is about, ask them, what is the Bible about? Their response will be interesting, but a lot of them will say, it's a guide to living a good moral life, teaching us how to be good people, how to follow the rules. And when they think about the stories in the Bible, like Abraham and David and Moses and Noah, when you think about those stories, they often see them as examples of how to be good people. It's like a how-to manual for behavior. It just helps us be good. 
but here's the problem. That's not really what the Bible is all about. You can even see it in this passage where he's talking about Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, to whom some of the biggest promises were made. Paul writes about him. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's huge. So what do we learn from Abraham's life? You could look at him as an example of good works. He did do good works. When God told him to move, he packed up and moved. When he was told to take his son Isaac to the mountain and sacrifice him, he did it. He went into action. He did a lot of good works. But was Abraham saved because of his good works? Is that what we're supposed to take away? No, Abraham was saved just like we are, by grace, through faith. And through that faith, he was counted righteous before God. You see, when Paul is speaking here, he's using an accounting type term. You ever went to deposit a check and they had to put a hold on it? Like you might get a little bit of it now, but most of it's gonna come later. This doesn't happen with the gospel. You get all the credit of the check right away. And that check is the blood of Jesus. It's not a check that's going to bounce. It's not going to expire. It's available for everyone and it's unlimited. You see that grace was available to Abraham, to Moses, to Daniel, to Nehemiah, and still to us today. That grace was there for my grandparents, for my parents. And praise the Lord, it's available to my kids and to their kids, and to your kids, and your family, and your friends. The same grace Abraham had is the same grace we get to have. Abraham didn't have to perform to get it right every time, and neither do we. And that's worth celebrating because we cannot get it right. How dare we add anything to the gospel? So number one, the entire Christian life is based on faith, not performance. Uh, Number two, this is the way it's always been. Number three, it's the only option. This is it, church. It's the only option for us. This is why it's so important to get this through our heads. If we try to live the Christian life by our own strength, we'll only end up condemned. We'll never measure up. There's no way we can live the Christian life on our own strength and be successful. You see, in verse 10 to 14, he contrasts two ways of trying to get God's approval. One way is to try to keep the law, to try to measure up. The problem is God has pronounced a curse on all who break the law, on everyone who breaks the law. Look at verse 10. He says, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. That is a huge problem for us. Our efforts to keep God's law always fall short. In fact, God pronounces a curse on all who fail to keep all that the law requires. If you were to go back to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 27, uh, verse 26 says this, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. You see, when the Levite priest back then would say this to the people, the people would respond by saying amen or so be it. But that leaves us in big trouble because of those who do not do everything required by the law are cursed. And no one does everything required by the law. And that's not very good news. At least not until Paul finishes his thought in verse 13 and 14. He says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul's point here is that perfect obedience was never the standard for being in fellowship with God, rather reliance upon his provision of grace. Nothing changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding salvation by grace. Man, and if you're like me, you're sometimes frustrated with the lack of progress in your life. You sometimes are pretty hard on yourself. Do you ever feel disappointed with yourself? Do you ever find yourself not living up to your, what you thought were good intentions? Do you ever get frustrated with your lack of growth? Here's what I know. Stop striving to get it right. 
The way you grow is the same way you became a Christian. We need to relearn the gospel every day. It's not about behaving. It's about believing. It's not about perfection. And I'm so sorry if you've been taught to behave only. Like you have to behave before you can belong. There's a scholar named Thomas Schreiner that had a paragraph that I read this week that I thought was powerful and I want to read it to you. It says this, focusing on our sinfulness could depress us and discourage us, but God does not intend us for God does not intend for us to live with a constant feeling of failure and condemnation. Our sins should drive us to the cross of Christ where the full payment was made for our sins. God's love, therefore, becomes exceedingly precious in the way we think and feel in our everyday lives. We acknowledge our sins daily, but we cling to the cross of Christ as the means by which we are forgiven. Hence, when Satan accuses us, we remind ourselves that we are free from all guilt and condemnation, not because we are so good, but because God is so loving and forgiving. Church, let's finish the same way we started, with grace. Let's finish our race totally dependent on the work of Jesus, by grace, not performance. And remember that it's always been this way. It's always been about grace. If you try to live according to your own strength, it's only going to lead to failure every time. I want to share a story about why this is so important to me and my family and how all of this just kind of became so real to me. Um, I was raised, like I shared, pretty legalistic and pretty rules-based home life, and I ended up going to a Bible college that was a lot like that. It was the same rules, independent fundamental Baptist, all that stuff. Um, and I met my wife there, praise the Lord, best thing that happened at my college, met my wife there day one of college, and it's kind of the redeeming factor of that for me. Um, but after college, the first church, one of the first churches I worked at was a church in West Virginia, and we made it a whole nine months there before we had to quit. There's just story after story that I could tell, but just one story to kind of give you context. And please don't hear this like I'm throwing stones at them. Um, I'm just trying to give you context. We hadn't been there very long, and the house we lived in was right on the way to the church. And the pastor would stop by every now and then, and he stopped in one time and um, saw that we had a picture hanging on our mantle there. And it was a picture of our wedding, of my wife and I. And my wife's wearing a sleeveless dress in her wedding, and the pastor asked us to cover that up. I got called into his office a couple of days later and said, what, why, would you post, why would you share something like that in your living room? And I just didn't get it at the time. But the people I was talking to, my influence, my dad, they were telling me, yeah, like, that's fine. Follow the pastor. It's okay to go more conservative, more rules. That's what we need to do to follow God. I just didn't get it. It was so frustrating to me. Thing after thing would happen. And then one time we were door knocking, like I shared with you earlier on a Saturday, inviting kids to come to church. And my wife and I knocked on a door, and there was a 14, 15-year-old girl um, who was so excited to go to church with us. She had never been to church before. And so she said, okay, I'll be ready. Pick me up tomorrow. So we get the church bus, the church van. We swing by, pick her up. And she runs out, and she's wearing like a prom dress type thing, pretty tight, pretty short. And I didn't think anything of it. Probably all her thought was, I've never been to church. When you go to church, you wear the nicest thing you have. So she went and put that on. We take her to church, and she wasn't in the church building for about two minutes before the pastor's wife came over with a trash bag and told her she had to wear it the rest of the service. This girl had never been to church in her life. And you know what her forever memory of church is going to be now? That she wasn't good enough, that she didn't measure up. And if that has happened to you in any way, I'm sorry, and I want you to know there's grace for you. There is. A little bit later on, um, I got a call that my dad had a heart attack. We lived in West Virginia. He was in Texas. So I fly back, and I didn't even have money to fly back to Texas. So the pastor buys me a plane ticket, gives me a little cash, and I was so thankful for that. So I get down there, and I've shared a little bit of this before, but my dad passes away um, during bypass surgery, and now my wife and son are stuck in West Virginia, and I don't have money to get them down for the funeral and to be with me and to comfort me and stuff. And so the church up in West Virginia, praise the Lord, takes a love offering and gets my wife down there, and um, we use that to be down there for a couple weeks. We, go, we get the funeral, take care of my mom, take care of my little siblings, and we finally get back to West Virginia. And we weren't there for just a few days. 
whenever the pastor tells me that he didn't appreciate the music we played at my dad's funeral. It was like Southern gospel music. It wasn't anything bad. And church, if that was ministry, if that was the Christian life, I wanted out. I wanted nothing to do with it. If it was going to be all about rules and performance, and if I was always going to feel like I couldn't measure up and couldn't get it right, I wanted out. So we resigned. And out of the very last paycheck, they took the money from that love offering and the $100 on plane ticket he bought me. And so my last check was like nothing, basically. And church, I was low. Like, I was done. I wanted out. About that time, I had this pastor friend who was just like, a refreshment to us. And he handed me a book um, called Grace Walk. It's written by Steve McVeigh. And that book opened my eyes to grace like I had never been taught before. I didn't realize I had that much grace available to me. I thought I had to perform and I thought I had to get it right. And I thought if I did all that, I would arrive at grace. But what it taught me was there's grace the whole way. His payments big enough to cover your past sin, your future sin, all the sin. So church, show grace. When people walk in here, you don't know their story. You don't know what they're telling themselves. You don't know what their past is like. Show grace. Live grace. Be grace-filled. If you could hear the negative thoughts going around the heads of the person sitting by you, if you could hear the negative thoughts running through your children's heads, you would show grace a whole lot more. I know we would. We start the Christian life with grace, and we end it with grace. You don't arrive at grace. You start with grace. You see, some of you were saved by grace, but you've been living by performance. And you keep beating yourself up because you're not getting it right. And church, show grace. Now, I could preach a message like this and in your head or somebody's head could be, okay, Nathan, so does that mean we can just go live however we want? We can sin. There's grace for it. It doesn't matter. No. If you've experienced the redeeming salvation of Jesus Christ and his grace, you won't want to. You'll follow Jesus. You'll want to press closer to him. And it won't be this thumb that's being pushed down on you like you're not performing. It'll be a relationship like a son and a father, like a daughter and a father. My prayer is that this message of grace would be a lot like it was to the Galatians. That this will be billboards for us where we will remember just when we're about out of grace, just when we think there's not enough grace, that there's more. Uh, How crazy would it be for us to get upset with people who need more grace than we do? Man, I took my son to a buffet this week and you go pay for the buffet, you sit down and you can eat as much as you want. I probably got two, maybe three, maybe four plates, I don't know. I got plates. You know what I didn't do? I didn't sit there and judge other people for getting up more than I did. There's enough of it. There's plenty there. I didn't even pay for theirs. In church, when we get mad at other people or upset for them showing more grace, how audacious of that is us. You get what you needed, they get what they're needed, and you didn't even pay for it. Jesus did. So how dare we limit the grace that's available to other people? And so church, show grace. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. I don't know how you were raised or if this rung a bell with you, if you were raised in a rules-based home and you've been dealing with that ever since. If you have, church, I want you to know there's grace. There is. There's grace for you, and we should finish just like we started. Man, I don't know how God's speaking to you this morning. Maybe it's just the fact that you need grace for the very first time in your life. You've been trying to live good enough. You've been trying to be good enough, to perform good enough. It's not going to get you into heaven. Grace of Jesus Christ, the faith in him is the only thing that gets us there. And that grace is what carries us through the Christian life. And when we arrive at the end, when we take our last breath, it's going to be grace that sustained us just like it started us. So I'm going to pray and just ask you to respond however God would have you to. Maybe if nothing else, it's just a realization and a thankfulness for how much grace is available to you. So Father, thank you for grace. Thank you that there's plenty of it. Thank you that we don't have to judge others who are living differently than we are or using up more grace in our minds. God, I'm just thankful for the grace you've given me. Thank you for the grace you give my kids and my family. 
God, I pray that you'd help me to show that grace to others. God, I pray that when they feel like they're running out of chances, that they'll know that your grace is there. There's more grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. In his holy name we pray, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand if you would and just spend the next couple of minutes responding.